technology. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I should have put another exclamation mark because this talk title already had an exclamation mark, so I felt like I was cheating a little bit uh, when it came to the CFP. Um, my name's Nick. I'm a front-end developer at Zero in beautiful, windy Wellington, New Zealand, uh, at Nick Piesco on all of your favorite social media and maybe some you don't like. I don't know most of you, so check that out. Um, this is an accessibility talk, so I feel I'm contractually obligated to start with this hopefully rhetorical question, why is accessibility important? Um, we all agree empathy and inclusivity is a good thing? Yeah? Yeah? Cool. <laughs> all right. Sweet ass, don't have enough time to explain why. Next slide. Um, <laughs> so that we have a shared set of accessibility goals, uh, the communities develop the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and they're organized around four principles. Uh, your UI has to be perceivable by the user's available senses, uh, operable by the user's chosen input method, uh, understandable, that goes for both the content and how to use the thing, and robust, uh, usable by a variety of rendering engines and assistive technologies. Uh, we're going to focus on one little tiny part of the first one, perceivable, uh, specifically color contrast. Um, so level AA, the kind of mid-range mid accessibility, uh, you want to hit a contrast ratio of at least four and a half to one, except for large text, which you have to hit a ratio of three to one. Uh, by the way, this is text on an image that's not accessible. Don't do this in your product. Um, <laughs> So this is important because not only are there users with the usual inherited color vision deficiencies, but as people age, the visual acuity isn't quite what it used to be. And worldwide, the fastest growing segment of population is age 60 and over. So between the people who have trouble distinguishing color and the people who just need a little help seeing better, we can spitball about 10% of the world's population or the users of your product can benefit from better color contrast. Now, when we talk about color contrast, we really mean a luminance contrast or brightness contrast. That's for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, there are a bunch of different kinds of color vision deficiencies. So if you work around one of them, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody with another one of them is going to benefit. And also, it's just easier to see the difference between light and dark than it is to see the difference between colors. The cells in your eyes that detect color need a lot more light to work than the ones that detect the difference between light and dark do. Uh, this is a 10 minute talk. We don't have time to talk about the science of vision, but it's in the longer version of the talk. We're going to though focus on the science of heraldry, specifically <laughs> the science of armory. Yeah, or these things, uh, coats of arms. Um, I'm going to focus on the English heraldic tradition for two reasons. Uh, first of all, that's the one I know the most about. And uh, second, they're the rules that I'm subject to as somebody who lives in New Zealand, which is a commonwealth country that doesn't have its own heraldic authority. Uh, now, you may have heard this. <laughs> It's true, it's a thing. I also had to cut that out of the short version. Um, so you may have heard this referred to as a crest, like the place of the Renaissance Fair who'll print out your family crest. Uh, that's not technically true. The crest is just the bit that uh, sits on top of the helmet. Uh, for these purposes, we're going to focus on the shield, the most important part of the arms. Now, arms have two main qualities. Uh, they're associated with the person, and they're easy to identify at a distance. Now, people, people have been decorating things since time immemorial. Uh, ancient Greek soldiers decorated the shields they carried into battle. Here's what a few of them looked like. And some of them look kind of heraldic, but they're not personally identifiable. It's more like a t-shirt or a pair of earrings. It's just something you saw that looked cool. It's not something that just kind of identifies you as you. And we kind of continue that decoration theme, but we don't really see that one-to-one -one relationship until the early 1200s, thanks to these closed face helmets. Now think about it, you've got a bunch of people lined up in front of you in coats of armor, and you can't see their faces. And so if they can use a different shield every day, like how are you really going to know who's who? A little bit important. So herald, since the term heraldry, heralds were the people in charge of organizing tournaments. So it was only natural that they'd be the ones to keep track of who bears what arms. So we start seeing the first rolls of arms, the list of who, who bears what arms, around 1240. This is the daring rolls, one of the earliest ones from around 1270 or 1280. Now at this time, people can just kind of start using any arms they want, which is only really sustainable to a point, right? If we want to avoid like impersonations and namespace collisions, uh, we've, <laughs> right? <laughs> we need a single source of truth to keep track. And so we have the offices of kings of arms. And those were created around starting in the late 1200s. Uh, 1484, King Richard III organized them into the College of Arms, the body that's responsible for all things heraldic in the UK. And the same body performs the same function today. 
College of Arms gets boss in 1673. The Earl Marshal, the highest ranking hereditary non-royal office in the United Kingdom. No arms are granted without his authority. Uh, this guy with the fabulous collar is Henry Howard, the sixth Duke of Norfolk. He's the first Earl of Marshal, Earl Marshal to oversee the College of Arms. And this is Edward Fitzalan Howard, the 18th Duke of Norfolk, who oversees the College of Arms today. If you apply for arms, you need to get this guy's permission. So I'm showing you this picture to prove a point, right? The symbolism in artwork has evolved over the past several hundred years, but the rules remain the same. So check out these arms. Um, these could conceivably be from four, five, six hundred years ago. Uh, these were actually granted in 2017 to a gentleman named Robert Pitcher from South Yorkshire. <laughs> right? And, as you may have noticed, heralds, much like people in tech, are notorious punsters. So look at you have three pitchers on the arms. So arms like these are called canting arms. Some of the earliest arms are these canting arms. It's a, tra it's a tradition that continues today. So every coat of arms, back from the first ones we started writing about in the 1200s down to the things that come out today, are described by the same language, blazon. It's a specialized language used to describe the composition and arrangement of symbols on a heraldic device. In the web world, we have something similar. We have HTML and CSS. <laughs> Specialized languages used to describe the composition and arrangement of stuff inside a web browser. So when you're granted arms, you're only granted the blazon, the description of your arms. Your letter's patent, the thing you get, uh, has a really nice illustration of your arms, but anything that accurately, accurately depicts that is technically correct. So you can think of this like rendering engines. There's a spec they're meant to comply with, usually, but they're not always the same, and they're not necessarily wrong. They're just different. So anyway, uh, blazon. So it has its origins in the 13th century, so it's de it sounds decidedly uh, Middle English with a lot of French mixed in. Uh, 700 years ago, we didn't have the wall of pigments at Home Depot, so we have a limited color palette to work with. And so tinctures fall into three general buckets. We have our colors, which are our paint colors our metals, which were frequently actual metal, gilt and silver and gold, or due to budgetary restrictions, white and yellow paint, and, and furs, which, yes, were frequently literally furs or stylized if you're painting them. So these are the arms of Grosvenor, early arms, azure, a bend, or. So azure, blue background, a bend, a stripe going from the upper left to the lower right if you're looking at it, or which is yellow or gold. And this language scales up, too. These are the arms of Winston Churchill. We've got... Yeah, we got quarters on quarters, we've got in escutcheons and in escutcheons, cantons. So even though Winston Churchill lived in the 19th and 20th centuries, if you gave this blazon to a heraldic artist from the 16th century or the 15th century and asked him to paint it, you'd probably get something pretty similar. So once again, to recap, arms are associated with a person and easy to identify at a distance. Now in tech, we have our computery way of identifying how easy it is to see something, the contrast ratio, right? So the same thing developed in heraldry. It's one of the most important rules, if not the most important rule, the one simple 600-year-old trick that makes your website more accessible. It's called the rule of tincture. <laughs> All right. First comes up between about 1410 and 1450, depending on who you ask. But the best-known version, of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with, comes from the Welsh scholar Humphrey Lewitt in 1568. <laughs> which says, metal should not be put on metal, nor color on color. So no metal on metal, no color on color. Let's go back to your tinctures here. So colors, you know, your paint colors a little bit darker, your metals were brighter, the lighter. So what do you get by not putting a color on a color or a metal on a metal? Bingo, accessible color contrast. <laughs> All right, so let's just check it out. Um, so remember 4.5 to one is our aspect, is our contrast ratio we're shooting for here. So we have argent on azure, we hit 5.32, pretty nice. It's a metal on a color. Let's put a color on a metal. We have ghouls on ore, 4.1. Double A for large text, not bad. Uh, let's put a color on a color. Let's put sable on purpure, 1.8. Doesn't work, right? And even if you squint, you know, you can kind of tell it's easy to identify the two on the left, but maybe not so much the one on the right. So let's talk about something more webby. So we have this uh, counter moving down the gradient, and hopefully this uh, thing will load eventually. Hey, there we go. So when it's on the darker side, it's clearly a color. So it uses white text so you can read it. So when, it goes to the back, so when it goes to the right hand side, background is a little bit lighter. And so for the text to be legible, it has to be dark, a color. So England does take the rule of tincture a little bit more seriously than the continent. It's broken sometimes, but not very often. Uh, still, only less than 2% of arms violated. Yes, scholars have studied tens of thousands of arms and found that only 2% of arms violated. So for something that really was not codified until we were a couple hundred years into it, it's about as hard and fast a rule as you can 
kind of put together, right? So even if we do break the rules sometimes, we can always get better. So when it comes to accessibility and inclusive design, incremental improvements are still improvements. So we just need to set a high standard for ourselves and keep working toward it so we can make the web a better place for everybody. Thanks. Thank you.